Hey folks, previously I made a video about the new app I'm working on, showing you how some of the special effects were made using SwiftUI. I'll add a link to that here maybe, in case you missed it. In this video, I want to do three different things. First, I want to tell you the app is now available to pre-order on the App Store. It's actually happening, folks. Go to the uh, App Store on your Mac or your iPad or your iPhone and search for Hacktivate, like that. Boom, and you'll find it hopefully. There we go, coming soon for a pre-order. Um, I get all three platforms. You get uh, 12 tutorials free of charge. Then as a one-time unlock to get the rest of the world map you can see uh, right here. And that unlock works in all platforms too. So you buy it once, you get it everywhere. Uh, second, I wanna show you how I adapted it to work on iPhone, even down to the very, very small iPhone SE. This took a fair amount of thinking, as you might imagine, but SwiftUI really helped. And third, I want to give you a look behind the scenes at how one of my favorite features was implemented. Now, if you missed the previous video, I'll suggest you start there. I run the whole lap back in an iPad simulator in slow motion, so you can really examine how the special effects are built and the animations and stuff. So the app's called Hacktivate. And it's a collection of over 200 graded cybersecurity challenges that must be solved using real world computer science skills. That means things like hashing and encryption and Unix terminals and web browser exploits and SQL injection and more. Plus, it's backed up by comprehensive tutorials to help you learn the skills you need to win. It's been so much fun to build, and the feedback on Test Flight has been hugely positive. Okay. Let's look first at how I adapted it all to iPhone. And this had to happen, because ultimately the iPhone resolution can also appear in iPad thanks to split screen and slide over. So I'll go ahead and launch the app for my Mac right now. Uh, it's thinking now, we're gonna build, boom. So here we go. Now, you might have noticed before the world map appears, there was a brief Hacktivate logo on the screen. I'll do it one last time. Um, so right again, you'll see the word Hacktivate appears for a second or so. There we go, fades away, world map appears. Um, the game loads almost instantly, but that little loading screen is a placeholder so I can silently spin up a web view in the background. WebKit is uh, famously quite a big framework, so by warming up now, I can avoid an ugly animation hitch when it's first used. Anyway, this is running my Mac now, so I can just you know, grab the window, move it around, and resize it, which is great. And, uh, Things like full screen mode work very well now, another happy side effect of uh, supporting resizing. But on iPad and Mac, where we have lots of screen space to work with, you can just go ahead and tap a region to jump into challenges. So here's the USA challenges down here, or I could say, show me uh, Canada or Central America or whatever. Just jump in, find a place you like and get started. But the interesting thing is when you go below a certain width, because obviously you're going to iPhone sizes then, so I grab this window and pull it downwards, downwards, and it's scaling, 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 and then eventually it runs out of space, it snaps, boom, to the iPhone size like that, and it gets real small, and it still somehow fits in there, and it sort of taps to expand, like so. Um, now, it's jumped to the compact width layout now, which is what you'll see on iPhone. Uh, here, space is obviously a lot tighter, so the map now at the top is really more about being uh, an illustration of your progress, changing colors from red to green or blue, whatever, as you progress, uh, rather than being interactive. And instead, the regions appear in this area below here, so you can move about between them using these lists like so, because obviously more uh, vertical space than there is horizontal space on iPhone. Now, the real challenge here was making sure you could move between the two size classes smoothly without losing your state. You know, it'd be annoying if the game reset because you went to split screen mode, for example. And so when you choose like, say, uh, zero cool in Central America, and then drag it out again, it jumps to the iPhone or iPad or Mac state, sorry, and stays selected. It knows what you were doing. Same for exact things like I'll choose like, got the sniffles as my challenge, and then scale it down. It'll switch to iPhone layout and keeps it selected, ready to go. And to do that, all the properties that determine which region is active or which challenge inside the region is active, they're all hoisted above the actual world map view. So when you switch between size classes, SwiftUI basically just picks up where you left off automatically. 
A bigger problem was the challenge view itself, because this is where the real work happens. You just have to crack codes and find hidden messages and images and more. So let's go ahead and make the screen nice and big again, so you can see the ideal scenario, you know, a, a Mac or an iPad or whatever, right? Um, and I'm going to choose one of the early tutorial challenges down here. It's very, very easy. It's introduction level stuff. Um, and it's teaching you about breaking codes. It's called Cypher Salad here. And I'll press Start Challenge. Now, I'm going to ignore the tutorial text at the bottom. It doesn't, doesn't matter at this point. It's fine. Obviously, you'd read that if you're doing the full thing, but I'm not doing it here. And I'll tell you up front, this is an example of a Caesar salad. Salad? Caesar cipher, which is solved by using the rotate text operation. And so I will send this to my salad toolbox over here, uh, and uh, I'll go ahead and, and add the rotate text operation. It explains down here how to do, but I'll, I'll ignore that. So I'll choose rotate text, boom. And uh, you can see there's input here and output, and I can choose how many places to rotate. So it's 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, whatever. And you can see it's changing the output as I go. So it's very, very fast interactive, which is very nice. Now, on iPad and Mac, we have lots of screen space. So we can see this input area and the output area at the same time and also adjust our live tools. You just click through things very quickly until I find the correct answer. But on iPhone, we have much less space. So I take a wholly different approach. If I squeeze this window down, a few things change. So let's get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and zip, snap, there we go. So, um, a few things change. First, the bar across the bottom now becomes this pop-up menu instead. So you can move between the different sections, but it takes two taps rather than one. Tap to activate, tap to change, like so. So it's still mostly there, it's a fraction slower. Second, this bar at the bottom, well, the tutorial bar explaining what to do, um, it used to have a little hacker avatar there that was helping to reduce the line length of iPad and Mac. But on iPhone, we need that space back, so it's just plain text down here. But most importantly, the toolbox, this whole thing in the middle, that adapts. So rather than having all three columns visible at the same time, you know, options, currently select stuff, and then input output. The user now selects which ones will work with at any given time using this little sort of segmented picker here. So inputs here, tools are here, and the active recipe is here. Now, that would have caused problems for this challenge because users have to be able to adjust the text, how they rotate it, and see the output immediately. Imagine if they had to change, you know, nine. Is that right? Tools. No, it's not. Recipe. Ten. Back and forth again, again, again. It'd be very, very slow. And so when we're working with these compact widths, I merge the output with their recipe, with whatever operations they're using right now. And so they can literally make a change here, 10, 9, 8, and see it in the same column, visible all the time, so they can see the results of changes very, very quickly. Now, there are other changes too, to make this thing work uh, well on, on, on very small devices, but they all follow more or less a similar formula. Me just sitting on the app <laughs> on an iPhone and thinking, you know, this feels clunky or this takes way too many taps and then rearranging things until it works better. And honestly, this is something that SwiftUI help with enormously because it makes it just so easy to break up views into small parts, then rearrange them like Lego pieces. Okay. Enough iPhone. I want to give you a look behind the scenes at how one of my favorite features was implemented. Uh, it is the Linux terminal, where, which you'll see in a bunch of um, challenges. Now, I actually added a new feature to the game recently. I'm still sort of fleshing out fully, but um, it exists uh, down here. It is the uh, Hacktivate World Championships. And these are five regions in the world that behave differently to all the others. The challenges are all on a specific theme. And the harder ones really push you in uh, exploring things and experimenting until you figure out solutions. And the first is you meet in Brazil and you're giving 10 challenges specifically about the Linux terminal. I'm going to jump into the very first one now. Uh, tutorial, listen carefully. And it looks like this. Now, again, this is a tutorial. And again, I'm going to ignore the text below explaining how to solve the tutorial, because it's teaching as you go, basically. 
Um, so <laughs> this thing here, it won't surprise you to know it's not a real Linux terminal. That would break all sorts of App Store rules, but I do want it to feel like a real terminal. So if I run help here, you'll see a bunch of commands are outputted that are all supported. We have basics like, you know, here's cat, we have ls, we have pwd, whatever. But there are also more advanced things. For example, we have a ps to show running processes. Uh, so I'll go ahead here and type ps. And uh, that's part of the tutorial, so it's, it's going to jump ahead slightly. But you can see it's running. Oh, we've got bash and the terminal running as well. Um, and if you want to, you can um, run it again and again and again. And these values change over time. So it was 48 seconds. Now it will be 1 minute 3, whatever, 1 minute 4. So they're evolving over time. Or you can do uh, ps-ef to list things with extra information. It's telling you down here to do the same thing, actually. Um, and now there's a bunch of stuff coming out. You can see all these different processes running. You know, we have a, a Apache 2 and MySQL D and stuff running. And they all have various CPU and memory times running that fluctuate slightly uh, as I run it back again and again and again. You can see again, I press up and enter like you're doing a real terminal to repeat the command again. Um, and I'm actually the uh, user tux right now, so tux at Linux. So if I try something like um, to kill all Apache 2, this is owned by the user www data. And so if I run that back, it'll say, I don't think so. Um, so it's 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 fairly realistic in terms of the, the structure we have. Um, if I run help again, um, there's way more advanced commands here. You know, this thing supports things like uh, bash aliases and environment variables and so forth. So it gives me lots of scope to have uh, interesting uh, hacking challenges. Plus there are ones specifically around server hacking tools. Um, you'll see things like netstat and nc plus tools like um, here's ping, we have uh, grep, there's strings, uh, there's history. But there's a bunch of interesting ways to um, create challenges. And again, they're all faked. You know, I've built them all to work as close to the real thing as I can, but there's no actual data being touched here. It's all running locally. And even lets you do, you know, stupid things if you want to. Nothing's really damaged. You know, if I, I'm here and I just do, let's do kill or bash, right? Kill my terminal, then yeah, I'm kicked off the server. Uh, in terms of how it's done, there is no magic here at all. It's just a lot of code. And this is only really possible to handle for me because each of the fate commands are more or less independent of the other commands. Things like the environment and aliases, they rely on shared data. But otherwise, they're separate. And so implementing, say, uh, grep or whatever, right, didn't mean touching the code for ls or wc, for example. This made it surprisingly easy to write. The whole thing is about 3,000 lines of Swift for all these commands to be run. To make it easy to manage, the code is at least split up by command. And so if I go to Xcode, I can show you some code here um, briefly. Uh, let's go to challenge and then terminal and then commands. And you'll see basically these, these file names match the commands they're working with. Uh, and so you can see they're all written out here to, to uh, work through neatly split up. For example, here's the code for alias, right? It's not a lot going on here. It's a fairly simple um, command, that one. So if there are no arguments passed in, show the aliases and then print them out neatly and so forth, right? Uh, it's just a function called alias, take some arguments coming in, namespaced inside my um, view model, just to keep putting uh, the namespace with things like end and exit and similar. Um, some of these are obviously very simple, you know, like exit, for example, if you were root, you're not now, said about nothing at all, done. Or like unset, also trivial, just removes um, environment variables you provide to it. Um, other ones are more complicated, like uh, netstat or nc and ping. And this is where the real power comes in because there are tools out there that let you run a real Linux terminal entirely through a browser rather than faked commands would have actual commands. But now I'm not, I'm not just doing this because I enjoy coding. Um, by implementing it all myself, what I effectively have is one huge mock for like test data. I have complete control over everything the user sees and does. 
So I can inject a fake process galore. I can create fake servers that respond to requests. I can add or remove commands dynamically. I can make programmers behave differently when certain environment variables change and so forth. It's a lot of work to, work to build, but it's all really flexible, giving me lots of scope to craft interesting challenges. Now, just to give you some perspective here, the complete app, when you go to the, that world map, um, has well over 200 challenges in these regions, the one you get when you buy the full app. And right now, there are only 12 terminal challenges. What you're seeing with all this code of 3,000 lines of Swift, that's just a small fraction of what Hacktivate does. There are stacks of other challenges like client-side exploits, server-side exploits, SQL injection, digging through uh, binary and, and hex, pulling out hidden messages from data, and so much more. Again, it's available to pre-order now. So please do check it out on the App Store, and thanks for watching.